Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So far in Jesus' ministry, he turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana. He healed the nobleman's son. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And he healed many with diseases. And he also cast out demons. And so from all of these miracles, the paralytic and his four friends realize that Jesus is more than just a man, that he must also be God himself. They believe that Jesus has the power to heal their paralytic friend, and so they made the effort to bring their friend to Jesus. They wanted Jesus to heal their friend. Jesus looks at the paralytic and says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. He was absolved of all his sin, and his sin was removed as far as the east was from the west, and God remembers it no more. But this is not why the paralytic and his four friends went to Jesus. They went to Jesus for him to perform a miracle. They want his, their friend to walk again. What did you expect by coming here today? Spiritual advice. Ten steps for successful living. Three ways to live a moral life. Happiness. An emotional lift. Financial blessings. What our sinful flesh may want is not necessarily what we need. The paralytic expected a miracle but he got his sins forgiven, and that was his most and greatest, his greatest need. Does a paralytic have sins that needs to be forgiven? You might say, what sins could a paralytic commit? Well, he could, he could break the first uh, commandment by cursing God for being paralyzed. He could break the uh, fifth commandment by having anger and murder in his heart. He could break the sixth commandment by having lust in his heart and eye. He could break the eighth commandment by gossiping or telling lies about his neighbor. He could break the ninth and tenth commandment by coveting, not having the things that other people have. So does the paralytic have sins which need to be forgiven? Yes, he does. He's a child of Adam and Eve. Do you have sins which need to be forgiven? What are the idols in your life? In what or whom do you trust in above all things? What do you worry or complain about? What do you trust? Why do you not trust in God alone? with all of your heart, soul, and mind? Is God's word evident in your daily speech and conduct? Is God's word and prayer despised or neglected in your life? You see, our sins have paralyzed our ability to earn God's favor. Our sins prevent us from walking our way to heaven on our own. Spiritually speaking, we're unable to save ourselves. We are unable to come to Jesus on our own. Just like the paralytic, we too are a child of Adam and Eve, sinners in need of forgiveness. This morning, you confessed that you are a poor, miserable, sinner. 
And you ask, you, you heartily repent of these sins and you ask God for mercy. Then you heard your pastor, a called and ordained servant of the word, forgive you all your sins. He stood in the stead and by the command of our Lord, speaking God's words, speaking God's forgiveness upon you. You are now absolved, and your sin is removed as far as the east is from the west, and God remembers it no more. Forgiveness gets at the heart of the matter. Forgiveness is your greatest need. Faith then clings to this word of forgiveness, believes it, and lives in the grace of God, even forgiving those who trespass against us. A forgiven life uh, lives, is thankful to God for all that he has done for us and shows that thankfulness in mercy and love toward the neighbor. Faith says, Amen, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven, and this forgiveness is just as valid and certain even in heaven as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. Now there are a lot of progressive churches that stopped having confession absolution in their services. They think that it's offensive to the visitor and it might be too negative. Furthermore, they no longer preach about sin and repentance. It's ignored. We even live in an increasingly lawless society. They want to get rid of the law so that it may get rid of any kind of guilt in their lives. And furthermore, the gospel is, is replaced by a power, a positive thinking type of message. But sin is the major problem in your life and in mine. And the root problem is not poverty or hunger or global warming, but a root problem is sin. And if we ignore the seriousness of our sin, then we will also see no need for the gospel. And I'll say that again. If we ignore the seriousness of of sin in our own lives, then we will also see no need for the gospel. Some people also think that it's offensive for a pastor to stand up here in a robe and to speak the forgiveness of sins, saying, I forgive you all your sins. They think that the pastor forgiving sins is ridiculous. Who does he think he is, they might say. But he is a called and ordained servant of the word, standing in the stead of Christ, speaking Christ's words. But uh, Jesus forgiving the paralytic was also offensive to the scribes. They said, basically, who does Jesus think he is? Does he think he is God? He is blaspheming. Little did they know that Jesus is God in the flesh with the full authority to forgive sins on earth. Jesus still has authority to forgive sin on earth. He does forgive sins through the voice of a pastor speaking in his stead and by his authority. Now, Jesus knew that the scribes were thinking evil against him, and so Jesus asked them a question, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or say to this man, rise and walk? Now, it's easy for Jesus to perform a miracle. He just speaks the word, and it is done. And so Jesus said to the paralytic, rise, my son, pick up your bed and walk. And a miracle happened. He was able to stand straight and walk. And all glory be to Jesus. This miracle proved that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. It's easy for Jesus to perform a miracle. He just speaks the word and the word does whatever he says. But for sins to be forgiven, Jesus must die on the cross the harder thing for him to do. Forgiveness is harder because it requires a perfect sacrifice upon the cross. And there on the cross, Jesus was despised. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was stricken. 
He was smitten by God. He was afflicted. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was oppressed. He suffered more than the paralytic ever suffered. And Jesus and the cross suffered more than any of us will ever suffer. Jesus went through all of this in order for sin to be forgiven. And there on Good Friday, he died and was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Easter is the proclamation that sins are paid for and that the Father's wrath is appeased. What moves God to forgive sin? God does not forgive sin because of any kind of goodness within you. God does not forgive sin because you are more and more sinless, if that's ever possible. Nothing inside of you and nothing you can do can merit the forgiveness of sins. But God forgives sins because of Jesus and his sacrifice upon the cross. Christ's death upon the cross with a thing is a thing that caused God to become favorable toward you, merciful and gracious toward you. God forgives sin because of the righteous and perfect obedience of Jesus. In our Old Testament reading for today, we learn that Jacob saw a ladder from earth to heaven. And there God is speaking, speaking promises to Jacob. Jesus is our ladder. He is the bridge that bridges earth and heaven. He bridged this gap. He descended from earth above, came down here to earth, died and rose again and ascended to heaven. And you see, you don't go up to heaven in order to get forgiveness. God is not some faraway God where we have to somehow go up and reach him. But rather, God brings heaven down to you today. To use Jacob's words, surely the Lord is in this place. This is none other than the house of God. Jesus is present in this place for you and for your benefit. This is the divine service. God who is divine serves you with the blessings of the cross and the resurrection. You see, the church is about the forgiveness of sins. Sinners confessing their sins and receiving God's grace and mercy on account of Christ Jesus our Lord. Now go through this with me. Let's look at baptism. It was instituted after the resurrection. And Jesus Acts says that baptism washes away sins. Let's look at absolution. This also was spoken after the resurrection. Jesus said to his apostles whom he just ordained, he said, if whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Let's look at preaching, something he also instituted after Easter. And the content of preaching, Jesus says in Luke 24, should not only be repentance, but also the forgiveness of sins. Now, the Lord's Supper is the only one that was instituted before Easter. But what does it contain and give? The forgiveness of sins. It was instituted on Monday, Thursday, celebrating the Passover. And so you can see that the blessings of the cross are given to you Sunday after Sunday by means of water, word, bread, and wine. It comes to you from the, from the font, from the pulpit, and from the altar. The church is about the forgiveness of sins, sinners confessing their sins and receiving God's grace and mercy in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this changes you for the better. A forgiven sinner forgives those who trespass against us. It's hard to do, but because God has forgiven us, then that forgiveness flows over to the ones whom we love and our neighbor and family member. 1 John chapter 4 says, we love, we love one another because God first loved us. If you were to ask the paralytic, what is the greatest blessing in your life? I'm sure he would say, I am thankful that I can walk. But my greatest blessing was the fact that God in Christ Jesus forgave all my sin." And so the greatest blessing in your life has nothing to do with material or anything material or physical. But your greatest blessing in life 
is the forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness, there is also life and salvation. Nothing else in life matters. Whether you can walk or not, whether you are paralyzed or healthy, there is nothing more important in your life than the blessings of the cross and the resurrection that God freely gives to you in Christ. On the last day, our Lord will say to you, rise out of your grave and go home to heaven. Then you will rise with an immortal, incorruptible, incorruptible body, a body that is glorified, and you will then enjoy eternal life in heaven forever where there will be no paralysis, no sickness, no sin, and no death. We just sang, and then from death awaken me, that these mine eyes with joy may see. O Son of God, thy glorious face, my Savior and my font of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen.